Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I am Barry Rowland, and in today's episode, we'll be reviewing the latest release from the guys over at Leo Bidner Electronics, the Sim Steering Version 2 Direct Drive Force Feedback Steering System, considered by many to be the current class leader in direct drive force feedback systems available to the Sim Racing enthusiast today. If you watched any of my videos, you know that the Sim Steering System has been my weapon of choice when it comes to doing all my sim racing. And I've been using it for about two years now. And that version has been, and still is, the best overall direct drive force feedback system I've ever used. So I'm pretty excited about this release of the version two system, which promises a noticeable improvement over the version one system. Also in this video, we'll be comparing the version one system and the version two system. And we'll be talking about differences and similarities between the two systems. And there is an upgrade path for existing version 1 owners, so we'll be going over the details of that solution. So, let's get started. Alright, so now we're going to take a look at the servo motor differences between version 1 and version 2. Now, we'll look at the version 1 first, but first of all, you can see that they're the same motor. They are AKM52Gs from Cole Morgan. They have the same torque ratings, which is 16 newton meters. Speaking of which, you can actually now get the 53G and a 54G servo motor with your version 2 kit, if you want. And this is 16 newton meters, the 53 is 20, and the 54 is actually 26 newton meters. Now, get the motor you want, I always say. It's, a little, it's really not that much more money between the 52 and a 54. And more is always better, right? <laughs> well... When I was making that decision myself, when I was doing my trade-in program, I decided to stick with the 52 for a couple of reasons. I did have the opportunity to test between a 52 and a 53 before, and they both had the same 10,000 PPR encoders on them, and I thought the 53 having more torque would, th you know, there's an argument to be had for this, that there's more dynamic range available for the hits and the spikes and things like that that we get from our force feedback wheel systems. So we get to feel maybe more, maybe a little bit more precision, a little more, a little more fidelity maybe or something. But I ran the 52 and the 53 right after one another, and to be honest, and I was looking for it, I could not tell any difference. And all I could tell was there's more power. And if anything, that extra power, I, I don't know, it just, I just decided not to get the 53. Now, if you get a 53 or 54, more power to you. There's, it has a lot of power in it, but 16 newton meters, I've actually hurt my wrist. I've hurt my shoulder socket before with the 52. So there's more than enough torque in here for me personally. And be, there's also a side benefit to that too that doesn't bother me too much, but it's just a nice side benefit that comes with the 52. It's a small package, very small footprint compared to any other direct drive force feedback system out there. The midges, even the small ones are very large motors. The 53G is the same footprint, basically, except it extends out about another, I don't know, three or four inches. It's pretty long. And then, of course, the 54 goes even longer than that. So a smaller package, less weight on your rig, and plenty of power for me, and all the precision and fidelity I thought that I could ever get out of one that had the encoders or the EJ encoders on them. So let's talk about the encoders on these. First off, let's look at the old one, or the version 1. It has a model number on it right here. Let's see if I can get this light not to glare on it there. And the important thing to see here is after this N is an EJ and then a 00. 00, zero is not relevant. The EJ is what we're looking for. That means the encoder type that is in this. And this is an encoder, not a resolver. And it also tells us, if we look it up, that this is a 10,000 PPR encoder, and which is a very high resolution if you want to go with CPR which is another way to measure the resolution. Really, it comes out the same, though, just divided by or multiply 4. CPR is 4 times the PPR. So PPR 10,000 is going to give you a 40,000 CPR, or cycles per revolution. It's just a different way of measuring the pulse going on internally on these encoders or resolvers. Because if you just measure the pulse, the pulse per revolution, then you're getting that, that top pulse out of this, the wave that we get when we actually go through an actual full wave that that pulse is in. And what I mean by that is it's like a sine wave. You've got your rise, you've got your fall, then you've got another wave, point, part of the wave rather, that's 180 degrees out of phase underneath, and it rises and falls back up to the 
line that's going across. Now, cycles per revolution is what CPR is. And they measure each one of those rise and falls of that wave. So that's four versus one for the PPR, which is the pulse. So it's just four times. So either way we go, it's easy to figure out what it really is if you want to rate it in PPR or CPR. And some manufacturers use CPR because it would give an indication to some people who didn't know any different that you're getting more resolution. But really, it's the same amount of resolution. It's just multiplied four times as the PPR. And most manufacturers use one or the other. It's rare that you find a manufacturer that uses both of them. <laughs> and that brings us to the new motor, or the, in my case, a refurbished or rebuilt motor that has the new resolver in here. Now, this model number is different. And that way, you'll know you have the new version 2 motor, at least in the 52G category. And that has a C and a dash. So there's just a dash in there as a filler, so they can keep their model numbers the same length. But it's just a dash. The, num the letter we're concerned with is a C instead of an EJ. It's a C. So the C means, and if you look it up in the white pair, what you can do is called a res resolver is called the SFD, which is a smart feedback device. Smart feedback device, not bag. And I looked that up too, and it's a resolver versus the encoder over here, and it has. And, and the funny thing is, they rate it in their white paper under CPR instead of PPR. And they rate this one under PPR. So even within the same manufacturer, they're doing it different ways. Eh, semantics to me. So the encoder, or the resolver rather, in this is what makes the difference. Even at 16.7 million, 7.777 million, whatever it is, CPR, as far as the resolution of the resolver in here, even if we go to the PPR numbers, that's 4.2 million PPR. That's an extremely large amount, substantial amount, of resolution gain in this motor over the older motor. Now, whether or not we're ever going to use that kind of resolution is anybody's guess. I'm sure that we're not going to be using 4.2 million PPR resolution out of this thing. I don't even know if our computers are capable of doing that. But it's nice to know that the headroom's there, I suppose. Kind of. But does it really matter? I don't know. And, and what we can use? I don't know. It's kind of back to the old, the, the thing I was just talking about with the differences in the torque. Is, is the dynamic range there going to make a difference or isn't it? But it's going to make a difference in the motor. I've already reviewed a couple of guys, or talked to a couple of guys rather, that have them, and they say there is a noticeable difference. And we're going to find out. So any other difference in the motor? Nope, that's about it. Um, I, there is one thing in the back here. Uh, we'll look at the pinouts on them. You can see that from there. All right. So over here we have the new motor, and you see there's only four pins over here in the feedback loop or the feedback connector. Over here we've got 13 pins. Now I'm not sure if we're using all these pins, but the dif another difference between the resolve over here, this has actually actually has EEPROM on board inside here that keeps all the motor settings on board to the motor. Now, I can't find anything that says that this does the same thing. So this might be some extra pins needed for writing the data every time that we start our version 1 system up. Might have to write the data to the motor about its motor settings because it can't remember them or doesn't keep them in there. Here it does. Now, as far as performance gains, I have no idea if that makes a difference or not. But it is something that I just wanted to share with you because there is a difference in the pinout. So you know if you got a 4-pin Cole Morgan, you've got the C resolver and you've got the version 2 motor. All right, anything else we're going to talk about? No, I guess that's about it. And we'll, again, we'll be mentioning the upgrade path that I went along as we go along in the review. So what we're going to do next is take a look at, and you'll see them in the back there, the actual controller boxes for the version 1 on the bottom and version 2 on the top. We'll take a look at the boxes. We'll crack them open, take a look inside, and see what differences there are, if any. Now we'll take a look at the controller boxes from the version 1 over here and the version 2 over here. And this will just be a quick look at the outside. As you can see, they're pretty much identical in setup. There's just a few little changes on them as far as labeling and things like that. Now, on the version 1 box, you can see that there is over here, some spider web on it, is they call this connector the COM1 and COM2. Now, COM1 is actually the power, and this is the feedback for the COM2. We've got our USB, and we've got what we call a remote e-stop. <laughs> and that's the labeling. So the labeling has actually changed, of course, for the, uh, the stem steering, too. 
and you can see it has a big two up here. Now, when these first came out, I actually see, saw pictures of guys getting these on the internet where it had this, but it didn't have the two in there. And the only way that you could tell it was a two, or they could tell it was two, unless they already had a version one like me, is on the back of the box, there's a sticker that said it was a Sim Steering 2 version. But now, all the boxes are coming this way. At least I assume all of them are, because that's the way mine came. And you can see the, it's a different decaling. It's all silk spring, screen printing on all, both of them. Now, we, this is labeled the power and the feedback, USB. And instead of remote e-stop, it says can, as in can stop this thing from hurting you. <laughs> all right. So other than that, and of course, we've got our mains connectors over here, just like in the version 1. Got this mains connector right there. They're pretty much the same. In fact, they're, they're identical boxes, even down to the little ribbing we have on the front of them. They're the same, which is a good box anyway. It's a nice metal box, and it's got good ventilation holes on both sides of them. There's actually no fan in the Sim version 2, and there's no fan in this one either, just to show you how efficient the power supplies must be in these units. Now, Enough you can see on, on, the, on the outside, there's not a whole lot to look at. The LED is a little different. It's a white one versus a green one. Other than that, not a whole lot going on here to show the differences except for stickers or screen printing. Now, what we're going to do is flip these over and take a look inside. Now, that's where we should be able to see some differences, or maybe not. Now, I had to flip this over upside down because the power supplies, the way they configure these things, if you watched other videos where I actually showed the boxes, I think it was in the Direct Drive Force Feedback Comparison video, we actually opened all the boxes up and took a look inside of what was going on. So we're going to do that here. I've taken most of the screws out, except for one, just to keep it from coming apart when I'm moving them around. And let's flip this baby open and see what's inside. And don't want to lose your screws. So you have to actually pull this lid out a little bit towards me. It kind of sits down in the lip there, you can see. And then once you clear that, you need to come forward this way to clear it off the back part so the whole assembly will tilt up for you. At least that's the general idea. And you got to wiggle it a little bit to get it to come out. But it will come. And there it is. So first off, you can see there's a lot of heavy-duty electronics going in here. I mean, look at the size of that iron core transformer in there. It's pretty big. And the power supply is actually an XP power a little closer here so you can see it. And this is an XP power. I'm going to grab her, my little pointer here. DNR 480. All right, so 480 means 48 volts and 480 watts. And it, again, there's the XP power little logo there. And you can see there's a circuit board over on this side. I'm trying to get that close enough. You can see that this is actually dated on a 2013 Leo Bodner, it says right there. I think you can read that. And it's got a big heat seek on the top here. Now, on the inside, if you can see it, I think I oh, got my lights to where you can see this. Right on the very inside in here, uh, careful I don't drop it, Barry, is it just says Sim Steering in there, Revision B. I don't know if you can see that well enough. Try to get the lights where you could, but uh, anyway, that's just the printing on it. We'll also notice that the cabling here, you can see the... The, the, this is over here is the data, and that's the power over there. And you can see it's all wired into the circuit board that's mounted over here. And looks like a little bit of spaghetti there, but actually it's a pretty neat wiring job, done pretty well professionally and carefully done. And over here on the other side, you can barely see the top of it. Over here is our mains power socket. So not a whole lot to see in here. USB is over here, and of course our remote e-stop is over there. Now. All the circuitry is over here. There's nothing else in the box, and everything just kind of rotates back in. So let's get that put back together, at least kind of put back together. And then we will go have a look over here at the other box. There you go, everything went back in. Now the version 2 box, and we're going to go ahead and flip that over too. Again, these come apart identically, so no big deal there. Another Phillips screw here to take loose. All right, don't lose your screws. And the same deal here, it pops up first, and then we pull it out just a little bit and try to tilt it forward without messing it all up. Okay, there we go. All right. Now, 
we can see here that uh, first off there's no electronics over here it's all gone but the power supply and the good news is the power supply is the same as the other one is uh, DNR 480 which is a good industrial rated power supply now there's also no wires there's a circuit board in here now what I'm going to do is try to flip this around here so we can get a better look at this circuit board and there's actually a positive and negative mains clip on wire going on here on the circuit board so we'll just go ahead and pop that off give us a little more clearance and they're pretty easy to get on and off, so it's not a big deal to put them back on. I have no fear of taking that off and hurting something. All right, so now we can take our power supply and kind of rotate it out of the way. Because we want to have a look at what's inside. And here we can see a very cool circuit board. So you can see, first of all, how much cleaner this is than the other one. With, the other, with all those wires going to the actual connectors over there for power and data. And here we can see... The different connectors they're actually soldered onto the boards and they have some chips behind them instead of the wires very clean install and there's other things we can see here too these look like they're power transistors right there big thick ones and we got a bunch of capacitors in the back here like five big capacitors and of course various chips here and there and really not much else to see here that's the mains and you might be able to see the revision on this board if i can get this up here and, in fact, why don't I just zoom it in? That might work a little better. And we'll pull this over so you can see it. All right, can we get some light on that? Anyway, up here in the corner, you can see that. Over here, you can see that this is a 20, 2004 to 2016 Leo Bodner board, sim steering version, uh, pro steering board so it's actually got it silk screened onto the board there i hope you guys can see that because i'm not sure how well it's showing up on my little monitor here but anyway that tells you that you have the new sim steering 2 board on there so again very neat very clean which gives us great airflow capabilities let me zoom back out here so again no need for any kind of fan whatsoever just a quiet box that sits there and makes no noise whatsoever just like the, the version one did the same thing but even with this this cleaner install here i can see where uh the airflow would be even better even with this big box sitting down inside of there so not much else to see here so we'll go ahead and put everything back together and i think uh, we'll cover the cables next and the differences between the version one and version two cables and once we're done with that, I guess we'll just start putting everything together, reassembling, and uh, get ready to run it on the rig. So we'll get to the cables next. All right, so now we have the two cables for each system. And this is the version 1 system. And actually, they're more alike than they are apart. Now, there is an upgrade path, and I mentioned it briefly in the intro for this review, that you can actually upgrade your version 1 system to a version 2 system and it's a thousand pounds plus you pay the postage both ways so it's not a small amount of money of course when you add the postage too but it does allow you a path to upgrade to the version 2 without having to sell your version 1 and then buy a whole new version 2 system which is around four thousand US dollars so that's kind of nice that Leo and his company has actually even offered that some companies wouldn't even offer that there is no upgrade path it's just pretty much you get what you get and we got a new one you want to buy that one you have to buy it but the reason i'm showing you a close-up on these cables first off the cables that actually go to the motor or motors are pretty much the same looking not not anything really different here as you can see there's no pin sticking out so we really don't know if there's any differences there and the pinout numbers are exactly the same on the version 2 as the version 1 cable. But when it comes down to the data cable, and we'll look at the power and data cable together over here. You can see the power cables over here, let's look at those first, are the same. You can see the same pinout. But when it comes to our feedback or data cable, you can see that the version 1 cable has a lot of pins sticking out of there. And the version 2 only has four pins so 
That means, now I'm not sure if they were using all the pins that are sticking out here. Maybe they were just using four here too. But now they're just using four, and this makes it a different cable. So you have to send them this cable back. Not this one, but this cable back because it's the version one. And you'll get a version two cable like this when they send you the version two upgrade kit. Just thought I'd mention that and show you the cable differences. Not much else to talk about as far as that goes. And what we'll do next is probably go ahead and start getting everything mounted up. And I'll show you the different brackets available and how we're mounting the hubs and the different hubs that are available. And we'll just take it from there. So now I wanted to give you a quick look uh, at the wheel, or rather the motor, mounted up to my wheel base and how I mount all my wheels to my rig. And as you can see, the first thing is, is that it kind of sticks out here is I've got a four inch aluminum extension on this and it's a hollow tube with a couple of aluminum flanges. You get it off eBay, 50 bucks or something like that. And the reason I'm using this is because I want my wheel to kick out from my motor. My motor is keeping my monitors from coming down to the height that I want them to behind my steering wheel. And it's just too high here. And if I just use the hub you see here, there's just not enough room between this hub and these bolts up here for the monitor to fit down low enough. So it's a simple matter of just getting a little extension. This is four inch, like I said, and put that on there and your quick release attaches to that and you're good to go. Now I can get my monitors exactly where I want them and still have, of course, plenty of room for my fingers for shifting and doing things so I don't hit the monitors with my fingers. But it's just a personal preference thing and you guys are gonna see this mounted in my rig and I thought I'd just explain it to you before you started uh, asking me a bunch of questions about it. And you can still ask me questions if you want, but just thought I'd give you an answer. Now you can see I have the connectors here rotated in a downward position because that's the way I like to run my cables. And also I've tilted the motor or rotated the motor. You can rotate it any way you want to around here to make these be on the top, on the bottom side. I like them on the side. Can't go up the bottom because of the way my rig is. And also you can tilt these up and down as you deem necessary to give you a good angle on your cables when you're mounting them. I'm using the old silver brackets to mount this motor. There is a newer, you can't even get these. Well, I don't know if you can't get them, but they're not on the site anymore for sim steering. These are. These are the newer ones, and they have a nice, uh, I really like them, actually, because the finish is great on them. Nice black crinkle finish kind of matches your motor. And, of course, they have a lot more adjustability in your angle here. In fact, even straight up and down, without any angle in it at all, it's still got an angle. Whereas these silver ones don't, they're straight up and down, but they do have a little bit of angle to them. And I've got them kicked out as far as I can. You can see a little slot there, what you can see of it that is exposed. And I've actually gone to the lengths of putting another quarter inch or a three eighth inch washer or spacer in there to kick it up just a little bit more for, because of the angle that I wanted. This would have given me the angle I wanted, but unfortunately for my purposes, it won't work because it's too high. What I mean by that is it mounts the motor too high off the surface. So I can give you an example here. If I put this next to this one, whoops, went around the right way, you can see the mounting holes are higher, about an inch or so. So that would kick the whole motor off of my plate higher, which would defeat the purpose of me trying to get my monitors lower because I couldn't get them lower because if the motor comes up, everything comes up. So for my purposes, I'm going to stay with the silver brackets. But these brackets are great if you don't have the same kind of issues that I'm trying to alleviate in my specific rig setup. But everybody's setup is different, so, and that's the beauty of this. You can do anything you want to and make it work any way you want to. So enough about that. It's all mounted, ready to go. So we're going to go ahead and take it over to the rig, put it on, and give this bad boy a run. Okay, here's the driver for sim steering. This is the same thing for version one and version two. You can see me moving the wheel here. Except in version two, our inertia and friction sliders are not grayed out. We can actually use them. Up in the upper left, you see file and help. File you can use to load files that you've created before for different steering wheels and different, or different steering wheel settings for different cars. Center calibration. It's simple enough. You center it, you hit calibration, and your wheel is centered. And there's always a default that you can apply if you want to. Now over the right, we're over here looking at the wheel angle and center offset counts and things like that. Overall dampening, I leave that at zero. And we have the all effects scale and the game dampening scale. I leave those at 100%. Inertia and friction. Well, that's personal choice, personal taste. Uh, you know, I, I don't know 
if you guys use something similar that I'm using here, but I can actually change that from car to car and track to track. So it's a variable and it's really up to the user. Easy enough to change it with the sliders. Um, inertia and friction, what's the difference? Inertia, it's harder for the wheel to return to center and friction is just makes it a little harder to turn the wheel to me. That's basically what it does. Uh, but there are nuances there that's hard to describe. So you guys can figure that out for yourself. Uh, hit apply when you're done with all your configurations and of course it says uh, keep your hands away from the wheel if you don't want to lose them <laughs> and once you apply then you have to turn the wheel to the left until you feel it set and I think it's about 45 degrees when that happens other than that there's really not a lot to do in the driver you can do a lot of things you can, in the game like iRacing uh, you can run your own force there whatever you feel like you need I run uh, 32 newton meters instead of 16 but again, all this is pretty much relative to what each individual wants. So I just want to give you a quick look at the driver itself and see the difference between the version 1 and version 2, which really just the uh, inertia and friction sliders are operatable now. So well, next we'll move on to actually driving the wheel. All right, so here we are having some fun at Sebring in the... Oh, here we go. <laughs> a little, little catch there. In the BMW Z4. I love Sebring for testing wheels and other things, cars in general, and how they handle because there's a lot of transitions between the asphalt and concrete services. Uh, the curbing is done pretty well on this track as far as iRacing is concerned. And we're going to cut a lot of this out though as far as me driving down the straight. Uh, you know, the Ullman straight's just way too much time. You don't need to see that. We're really interested in seeing the wheel working. And you will see this wheel working, me working the wheel right there. The overall takeaway from this is this wheel does have more information to convey to you. Uh, here we are in three, four, and five going over concrete, back to asphalt, then back to concrete. While we're already in a turn on the asphalt, we transition to concrete. Concrete, rather, You can actually feel the transitions from the textures of the asphalt and concrete here. I'm feeling the texture of the track now like I never did before. And I'm not sure why this is happening, if it's the bit, you know, better resolution what we're experiencing here with the new motor and driver setup, I don't know, or firmware, whatever it is. But coming through turn 17 here, you can see I'm just working the wheel, and it's all coming so naturally, even more natural than the version 1. And I think it's because I'm feeling texture. When you get into a slide on a lot of steering wheels, uh, it's almost like we lose contact with the pavement for a little bit as far as the force feedback goes. And with this wheel, this Sim version, two, uh, Sim Steering 2, it's just amazing how much more information I'm getting. And it's, it might be not a huge amount, but what you are getting over the version 1 is very important, let me put it that way. And I'm going to just, just call it texture. That's the best way I, I've, I thought about it for a while, how I was going to actually talk about it. And it's like I can feel the texture of the road surfaces better than I ever did before. In version 1, I don't feel, it's like something is missing after you get off of the version 2 wheel, switching back and forth. And going across the asphalt, especially in the turns, not so much on the straights, but even in the straights, it's like you can feel the road rolling under your tires, where you just don't get that sensation with any other wheel. It's, and I, like I said, I'm going to keep saying, calling it texture. And when I transition, or the car transitions from the asphalt back to the concrete, like over here in turn 17, we'll see it right here, you feel the texture difference. It gets like it's all of a sudden it's more slippery in turn 17 because I'm on concrete. And of course, here's all the bumps, bang, 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 and you've got all those G-forces hitting you at the same time as trying to pull you to the left coming around that turn. Here again, from asphalt to concrete over in turn 7, you can just feel that transition. And here's a, a, a peculiar thing. Once I'm going over these concrete patches here in turn 8 and turn 9, it feels like the car is actually, the suspension is compressing and lifting up over the turn. It's a very strange feeling I never felt before. And again, I have to uh, just say it must be the texture differences, the detail I'm getting in it. Uh, here's a slide, I think, here. Yeah, right here. Now, I normally would never catch that slide in turn 17. Once I'm out, the back end steps out that far, it's gone. And because of the information I'm getting, I was able to catch that. And I would not have been able to catch that in a version one, I don't think. Even though I'm very familiar with the turn and I've gone around it millions of times, it feels like. So, 
the takeaway here is there is a difference in these wheels. I, I was a bit skeptical at first. I said, okay, well, the version one's pretty darn good. Uh, is the version two going to be really any better or that much better? And I have to say it is. It just conveys more information. Even when the wheels feel like they're sliding across the surface, it still feels like you can feel that texture underneath your steering, and it helps you adjust for those, just like that, on those slides. So anyway, enough talking about the wheel. Uh, next, we'll go ahead and get to the final thoughts and see what we take away from all this between the version 2 and the version 1. So we'll get to that next. Final thoughts on the SIM steering version 2 force feedback system from the guys at Leo Bidner Electronics. You know, I've always loved using my SIM steering version 1 wheel system. After putting so many hours on that system over the couple of years I think I've had it now, it always seemed to put a smile on my face. So, when I heard they were putting out a new version of that system, I have to admit, I was a bit skeptical at first. After all, uh, there would need to be some real improvement in the quality of existing force feedback for me to be able to say that it was a better system than, of course, the original version 1 system. Sure, the numbers look good, a new 4.2 million PPR resolver. <laughs> but if you're like me, over the years, You've seen products that, well, when you first looked at them, they looked great when you added up their numbers and whatever feature set they may have had. But at the end of the day, they just didn't seem as good as we'd hoped they'd be. Hence my subdued expectations for this system. Well, I'm happy to report that after switching between the version 1 and the version 2 wheels back and forth over the same track at Sebring, that there are some noticeable improvements. For me, it was as if, for the first time, I was going over the concrete patches at Sebring, I was feeling a, a surface texture difference between the asphalt and the concrete. Sure, you feel the same you know, bumps I felt at the version 1 system, but there was something very noticeable being added to it. When I went over those patches of concrete, I had the sensation that the car's front end was actually elevating as it rolled over them. Now, I don't know how that happens because the steering wheel itself doesn't move up or down. Uh, we feel the force feedback effects in a rotational axis. So how do I get the sensation of rolling up and over those surfaces? It has to be the result of the added surface texture that is felt with the new system. There's a noticeable difference in the textures between a racing surface, whether it be asphalt or concrete or something else, which gives you a more noticeable physicality to driving a car. Now back when I tested an OSW wheel with an AKG 53 Cola Morgan motor, I felt a hint of texture when we had it dialed in at the best settings for me personally. But with the SIM steering version 2 unit, I can feel it in abundance. Leo, John, and the rest of the guys at Leo Bonner Electronics have done it again. The bar is once more raised in force feedback steering systems. Of course, all this comes at a price at around $4,000 US, which only includes a Cola Morgan motor, a controller box, a set of cables. It is an expensive ticket to force feedback bliss. Now, there's an upgrade patch for the version one owners, which will ease the pain a little at just under 2,000 US dollars after you pay the shipping both ways for the exchange of the parts. Still though, a lot of money. But for me, I did use the upgrade path to the version 2 system, and as far as I'm concerned, it was money well spent. That's it for now. I'm Barry Rowland, and thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel.